Well, good evening everyone and uh, thanks for joining us again for tonight's devotions. I want to read again from Ephesians chapter 1 and beginning at verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Well, um, last night we looked at this well-known prayer of Paul's with a focus on what was not there. Namely, that Paul did not pray for a change in their material circumstances. The fact that such a request is not there kind of stands out. For life in the ancient world was hard enough. Poverty and disease were commonplace. And on top of dealing with these normal facets of life, uh, the Christians also had to suffer social isolation uh, and persecution. Uh, Persecution right across the Roman Empire. It wasn't just true for the Ephesians, it was true for churches all over the empire. Despite this, Paul does not pray for the Ephesians or any other congregation that these circumstances in which they lived would be changed. Rather, at the heart of his prayers for the churches was the desire that they would come to know God better. But I guess it's fair to ask, what does Paul mean by getting to know God better? And according to uh, this prayer, uh, getting to know God better means that we would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And the rest of the prayer really flows out of that. Now, it's very unlikely that Paul is praying for a second work of the Spirit in the lives of the believers, subsequent to their conversion, or for a special wisdom and revelation that just a few super spiritual Christians could have. Rather, he's speaking about the ongoing work uh, of the Spirit in the life of every believer, work that began when they came to faith in Christ and were indwelt and sealed by the Spirit. In John 16 and verse 13, Jesus told his disciples that it would be the Spirit who would lead them into all truth. And and that you get that sense of of being led, of being taken forward. And so what Paul's praying for here is that the Spirit would continually lead and take them forward into deeper knowledge uh, and wisdom uh, in regard to God. He's praying for the ongoing, continual work of the Spirit in their lives so that they come to know God more fully. Now, such ac- uh, knowledge never really happens by accident, for not only is it made possible only by the Holy Spirit, full knowledge of God is not an immediate byproduct of salvation. But it's part of the process of our sanctification, our growth into Christ likeness. In the New Testament, we are told to keep on being filled with the Spirit, to avoid the attitudes and behaviours that restrict the growth of the fruit of the Spirit. We are told to keep in step with the Spirit, and crucially, we are told not to grieve the Spirit. When the Bible speaks about knowing God or knowledge of God, it's not really talking about head knowledge or intellectual knowledge, but it's always referring to experiential knowledge. This is stuff that we know, that we have experienced, and that's how we know. So it is as we study the Word of God, as we obey its commands, as we pray, uh, as we keep in step with the Spirit, as we go on being filled with the Spirit, as we uh, allow the fruit of the Spirit unhindered growth in our lives and so on, that we grow in the wisdom and knowledge of God. The result of having that spirit of wisdom and revelation is that the eyes of our hearts will be enlightened. That is that they will understand, our our heart will understand the benefits of the gospel of Christ in an experiential way. 
The heart is what we might call the very centre of what makes us, us. As Tim Keller writes, the heart is the repository of one's core commitments, deepest loves and most foundational hopes that control our feeling, our thinking, our behaviour. To have the eyes of your heart enlightened, he says, with a particular truth, means to have it penetrate and grip us so deeply that it changes the person. And he gives the example that we all know that God is holy, but when the eyes of our hearts are enlightened by that truth, with that truth, we find his holiness both wondrous and beautiful, and that in turn causes us to make the choices to avoid attitudes and behaviours that displease or dishonour that holiness. So it's not just knowledge and wisdom in the head, but it's, it's penetrated right to the core of our being and changed us. It's clear then that this wisdom and knowledge is not an intellectual understanding, but is rather a lived out experience of God. Later in this letter, Paul will pray that the Spirit will give them power to grasp all the present, uh, past and future benefits of being united with Christ by his Spirit. And that grasping, that understanding is not just in their minds, but is expressed in the reality of their shared life with Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who gives Christians the knowledge of what God has given them in Christ. As Philip Melanchthon wrote, to know Christ is to know his benefits. For Paul then, prayer is not merely a way of getting things from God. It is rather a way to get more of God. In the sense that as we come to know him more fully, or as Isaiah 64, 7 puts it, prayer is a way of taking hold of God. Perhaps now more than ever, we need this very wisdom and knowledge. Keller makes a crucial point when he writes that most contemporary people base their inner life on their outward circumstances. Their inner peace is based on other people's valuation of them, how many links and reposts they get on their social status, uh, prosperity, on their performance. Paul is teaching that for believers it should be the other way around. Otherwise we will be whiplashed by how things are going in the world. Although I'm asked regularly, I've tried to avoid making definitive statements as to what God's purpose is in this pandemic. There are plenty of other would-be prophets happy to share their take on it. I've read blogs proving from scripture that this pandemic is one of the plagues of the end times and I've read blogs proving from scripture that it's not. But some aspects of this crisis, I think, from a biblical standpoint, are fairly obvious and self-evident and that this pandemic has provided opportunities that we might have otherwise missed. Not that those opportunities were not already there before the pandemic but that I think we were too distracted to notice them. But now our lives have been unsettled and overturned. We've been forced into a situation in which we, the opportunity to get to know God better through a deeper study of his word and a deeper experience of his presence in prayer is, to coin a phrase, in our faces. The English word crisis traces back to a Greek word that means to decide. All civilizations reach a tipping point of greater glory or collapse. And this current crisis could be ours. We're at a point in our history where we have to decide. Both the believing church and the unbelieving world are being given an opportunity to decide our future. We have to choose to decide to know God more fully and more deeply, to know him better or to turn away from him altogether. And it's that decision, more than any other, that will shape the future of this and the next generation. Thanks for listening.